a way of engaging with the fabric of material reality using spiritual principles. That's what the Bible is. It is a user guide for material reality using spiritual principles. And it has been vastly misunderstood. And we are clarifying that right now. We are clarifying the purpose of prayer right now. All right, welcome back to another episode of Daily Neville. I am your host, Josiah Brandt, and Daily Neville is all about breaking down the teachings of Neville Goddard, making them easy to understand, easy to digest, easy to apply in 20 minutes or less. Now, this is episode one of season two. The book that I've selected for season two is Prayer, the Art of Believing. That's a 1945 book by Neville Goddard, and we're going to dive right into it. But first, before we do, I want to talk a little bit about this idea called prayer. Prayer is arguably one of the most misinterpreted ideas from the Bible. As I was thinking about this and I was thinking about how to present this, how to like really break this down, make this accessible, I realized that this is actually probably one of the most important ideas that Neville teaches. Why? Because it really is the secret. Prayer, if feeling is the secret, prayer is the secret, but prayer actually is a feeling. And we're going to talk about what I mean by that. We're going to talk about what Neville means by that as we dive right into this episode. But I want you to think about this is actually probably one of the most important ideas that Neville communicates throughout all of his work, this idea of prayer. Humans tend to interpret reality based on whatever the technology is of the time. And so one of the key ideas that we're going to be exploring as we move through this series is the idea of updating upgrading, modernizing Neville's teaching. So Neville's going to talk about some things that maybe we don't identify with quite as much here in the 21st century as we did back when he was teaching this in the 1940s, as it were. But we're going to update these teachings. We're going to make them as easy to understand as possible. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive right in to chapter one of Prayer, The Art of Believing by Neville Goddard. Neville starts this book with a preface. And the preface says, Prayer is the master key, the master key. A key may fit one door of a house, but when it fits all doors, it may well claim to be a master key. Such and no less a key is prayer to all earthly problems. Now, this is why we're saying that prayer really is one of the most important ideas that Neville teaches. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Chapter one, the law of reversibility. Pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Tennyson. Neville writes, Prayer is an art and requires practice. The first requirement is a controlled imagination. Parade and vain repetitions are foreign to prayer. Its exercise requires tranquility and peace of mind. Okay, we're going to start right there. So prayer is an art, okay? Is there a science to prayer? Well, yes, but not in an external way, not in the way the world may think. So we're going to explain and, 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 and dive deeper into this idea of prayer as an art. So art requires practice, meaning that maybe with prayer, the idea here is to learn how to do it properly and to learn to apply it, not so much in a scientific way, but more in an artistic way way. So what does he mean by that? Well, he says the first requirement is a controlled imagination, a controlled imagination. Now, I would have to say when I look out at the world, uh, and also when I look at my, the own habit of my own personal life, over the years, I would say that a controlled imagination is something that I've had to practice. And I think it's something that a lot of people maybe don't practice, but probably should. What does it mean, a controlled imagination? Okay, so that voice that's going on inside of your head right now, well, for a lot of people, that's the monkey mind. It just kind of runs all over. It's out of control. So what does it take to control one's imagination? It takes a new paradigm of thinking. It takes a new paradigm of reality. It takes a new paradigm of understanding of what the imagination is and how to apply it like a tool. Okay. Neville says, parade and vain repetitions are foreign to prayer. Parade. What is parade? So making a big to-do of it. Prayer doesn't care about making a big to-do of it, making a big event out of prayer. You know, uh, as, as Neville will say later on here, you know, churches, they tend to make a, a big to-do out of prayer. You know, everybody folds their hands, bows their heads, closes their eyes. There's a kind of a big, you know, rig rigmarole about it. 
that's foreign to prayer, Neville says. That's not the point. Prayer doesn't natively understand parade and vain repetitions. Okay, vain repetition. So saying it over and over again as though that makes it somehow more effective. Vain repetitions, right? Saying it over just for the sake of saying it. Now, prayer is a practice, which means you have to continue to pray. So it's not about just praying once and it's done. It, it is a practice, right? It's, it's an ongoing way of being, a state of being. But vain repetitions are foreign to prayer. Its exercise requires tranquility and peace of mind. Tranquility. Well, controlled imagination is a product of tranquility. If your mind is running all over the place, it's not peaceful and it's certainly not tranquil. Use not vain repetitions, for prayer is done in secret, Neville writes. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Now, if you're familiar with Neville's teachings, you understand that when he says thy father, he's not talking about something outside of yourself or an external being. He is talking about first cause, that fundamental state of consciousness which gave birth to the universe. I am. Consciousness itself. Consciousness itself is the father giving birth to or fathering the world that we interact with, the material world. The ceremonies that are customarily used in prayer are mere superstitions and have been invented to give prayer an air of solemnity, solemnness, right? They've been invented, he says. So the church with its incentive to encourage engagement has created, uh, you know, customs around prayer that are not required, but give it an air of solemnity so that people take it more seriously. They've been invented. And Neville says, this is superstition. Those who do practice the art of prayer, Neville says, are often ignorant of the laws that control it. And that, of course, is why we're here today, to go ahead and become aware of the laws that control prayer. They attribute the results obtained to the ceremonies and mistake the letter for the spirit. Now, if there's one thing that causes problems in this world, I would say that's probably what it is. It's mistaking the letter for the spirit. Now, what does that mean? So the letter is a way of communicating the spirit, but it is not the spirit itself. So when I say a set of words, right, it is the meaning carried in those words that you are meant to interpret rather than the words themselves. Okay, The essence of prayer, Neville writes, is faith. But faith must be permeated with understanding and given that active quality, which it does not possess when standing alone. What is the active quality of prayer? Faith. Faith is the active quality of prayer. But faith must be permeated with understanding, he says. So you have to know how this works. You have to know how it works to give it that active quality, okay? Now, when I say know how it works, I'm still talking about a childlike understanding, right? This is not complex, but it does require engagement with this idea, engagement with this concept. Therefore, Neville writes, this is a quote from the Bible, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding, okay? Wisdom and understanding. This book is an attempt to reduce the unknown to the known by pointing out the conditions on which prayers are answered and without which they cannot be answered. It defines the conditions governing prayer in laws that are simply a generalization of our observations. The law of reversibility is the foundation on which its claims are based. So this book, Prayer, the Art of Believing, is based on the universal law of reversibility. Now, Neville's going to explain what this law is, the law of reversibility, and he's going to use kind of these outdated middle century, middle 20th century ideas, okay? Not, not, not that they don't still hold true to today, but they are a little bit outdated for our current understanding. We're going to do our best to upgrade. So Neville writes, mechanical motion caused by speech was known for a long time before anyone dreamed of the possibility of an inverse transformation. That is the re reproduction of speech by mechanical motion, the phonograph, okay? So I can speak and I can vibrate things around me. That's mechanical motion 
caused by speech. And this was known long before anybody realized that mechanical motion could reproduce speech. So speech can cause vibration. Vibration can cause speech. So the phonograph, I'm speaking, I'm vibrating, I'm cutting into wax. And then when I replay using a phonograph machine, I can then rehear the speech that I spoke because the recording is replaying. That's the law of reversibility. We encoded it using speech. It's like directional, right? Speech into mechanical motion, mechanical motion into speech. That's the law of reversibility. Neville is implying that this is true. This is a universal law. So this is true in all cases. If it can go one way, it can come back the other way. And he's going to give a couple more examples of this. Neville writes, for a long time, electricity was produced by friction without ever a thought that friction in turn could be produced by electricity. Whether or not man succeeds in reversing the transformation of a force, he knows, nevertheless, that all transformations of force are reversible. If heat can produce mechanical motion, mechanical motion can produce heat. If electricity produces magnetism, magnetism too can develop electricity or electric currents. If the voice can cause undulatory currents, so such currents reproduce the voice, and so on. Cause and effect, energy and matter, action and reaction are the same and interconvertible. Now, why is Neville talking about mechanical motion creating speech, speech creating mechanical motion, electricity, magnetism, et cetera, and so forth? Why is he talking about this? Because he is laying down a premise for prayer. And he's going to really break apart what prayer is using this as the premise. So he's saying prayer is based on the law of reversibility, and it's an art, and it requires practice. So listen very carefully here. Neville writes, this law is of the highest importance because it enables you to foresee the inverse transformation once the direct transformation is verified. If you understand the law, you can see what will come out. A creates B, B can also create A, and you can foresee B creating A if you can verify that A created B. This is where he applies it to the idea of prayer. If you knew how you would feel, how you would feel, were you to realize your objective, then inversely, you would know what state you could realize were you to awaken in yourself such feeling? Let's say that again. If you knew how you would feel, were you to realize your objective? Because we're praying for something. That's usually what it is. You're praying for something. Okay, so you're asking for something. So what he's saying here is if you knew how you would feel if you had that something, then inversely, you would know what you could achieve, that you know what you could have, were you to awaken that feeling now? Feeling is the secret, okay? This is, this is no departure from anything else Neville has taught. This is very congruent with all of Neville's teachings. He's just explaining it a slightly different way, and we're breaking it apart so that we can really master this art and begin to practice it. Neville writes, the injunction or command to pray, believing that you already possess what you pray for, Mark eleven twenty four, 24, is based upon a knowledge of the law of inverse transformation, a universal law, a law that is true in the physical world, the material world, the spiritual world, as above, so below, as below, so above. Inverse transformation. If your realized prayer produces in you a definite feeling or a state of consciousness, then inversely, that particular feeling or state of consciousness must produce your realized prayer. Okay, so let's make this extremely relatable. Let's say that you desire a promotion at work and you could reach out and touch in your imagination how you would feel when your boss was shaking your hand saying congratulations on your promotion. That feeling, if you knew how you would feel, were you to receive that promotion? And 
you understood the law of inverse transformation, then you understand that were you to feel that way now, you could awaken the promotion. Okay, this is a way of engaging with the fabric of material reality using spiritual principles. That's what the Bible is. It is a user guide for material reality using spiritual principles. And it has been vastly misunderstood. And we are clarifying that right now. We are clarifying the purpose of prayer right now. Because all transformations of force are reversible. You should always, always pray without ceasing. You should always assume the feeling of your fulfilled wish. The feeling of your fulfilled wish always persistently assumed is praying without ceasing. You should awaken within you the feeling that you are and have what before you desired to be and possess. That's a time shift. That's a time shift. So you're taking, oh, I wish that I could be and have this. Will you awaken from the wish into the feeling of having? I am that and I have that as opposed to I wish I were that and I wish I had that, right? It's a time shift as opposed to putting it outside of you and in the future, you are assuming it now. Neville says, this is easily done by contemplating the joy that would be yours were you an objective and accomplished fact. So tune into the joy. Tune into the joy that would be yours so that you live and move and have your being in the feeling that your wish is realized. Three things. Live, move, have your being in. What a powerful potent call to action. Neville is saying live and move and have your being in the feeling that your wish is realized, that your wish is fulfilled. What a powerful command. What a powerful invitation. The feeling of the wish fulfilled, if assumed and sustained, because you're practicing it. You don't just do it once. You're practicing it. You're sustaining the feeling that I am. It must objectify the state that would have created it. This law explains, Neville writes, why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. I know that I have that thing because I feel that I have it. And feeling is the secret. Consciousness is the first cause. So if I am aware in my consciousness of having and being, that is the substance. That is the, that is the, the layer one reality of it. That is the root of it. That is the source of it. Because consciousness in our model of reality is first cause. And this is why, Neville writes, he calleth things that are not seen as though they were. And things that were not seen become seen. Assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled and continue in the feeling that it is fulfilled until that which you feel objectifies itself. And he closes this chapter with the following paragraph. He says, if a physical fact can produce a psychological state, a psychological state can produce a physical fact. If the effect A can be produced by a cause B, then inversely, according to the law of inverse transformation, the effect B can be produced by the cause A. And therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them and you shall have them. And that's a Mark eleven twenty four. So this is a powerful clarification of prayer as an art that requires practice. Prayer is actually a way of being. And this is why the Bible commands us to pray without ceasing. Right? If doubt is the devil and the devil is the source of doubt, then doubt would be falling out of the state 
and looking at the material 3D reality and saying, I'm not that, and I don't have that, and that's doubt or the devil. Prayer as a controlled imaginal state of practice, right? It's ongoing, incessant practice, praying without ceasing, is believing. And that's the truth of faith, believing that I am and that I have without doubt. And that is operating the law of consciousness, the law of assumption, the law of attraction, the law of awareness. In the next episode, we're going to dive into the dual nature of consciousness. We're going to break that down and gain a wiser understanding of how to apply these ideas in our everyday life. If you're interested in the things that I don't talk about on YouTube, I have to join my email list. There's a link in the description below. And until next time, imagine wisely, my friends.